Welcome to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy's production of FlagandBanner.com. Stay tuned to the end of the show to hear how you can get a copy of this program and other helpful documents. And now, it's time for Carrie McCoy to get all up in your business. Thank you, Chris. If right now you're sitting at your computer, you might want to watch us live on FlaggingBanner.com's Facebook page. It's kind of fun to see what goes on behind the scenes. It's reality radio, and today, as really with every day, a lot's going on. The Hey, Chris. Yeah, The air conditioner's on over there. I think it's messing up our mics. All right, stand by. I see Jason waving to us over there. Thank you. Like I said, you can watch us live in the action on flagandbanner.com's page and see us scurrying around, hand-waving to each other about the air conditioner being on. We're not as professional as we might like to be over here, but we're getting okay. there. Absolutely. It, this is my 101 show, so that's all, I'd call that pretty professional. That's a lot of shows. And um, like I said, if you're sitting at your computer, you might want to watch us. Uh, I want to welcome back my new co-host, Chris. Well, thank you. Chris Cannon. Yeah. Thank you. I was out last week seeing my son in Ohio. Mm -hmm. He's going to the Ohio State, getting a Ph.D. in horticulture because he said we're going to need food. The Big Ten. Yeah. I'm from Iowa, so I'm a Big Ten boy as well. Oh, that's true. I get to watch the SEC and the Big Ten now. There you go. Um, If uh, anybody's listening, they might want to know that you are Chris. Mm Mm-hmm. Cannon, mm-hmm. who used to be the DJ on B98, yep. so some of them might remember you. Yep. Uh, thank you again for helping out last week. Uh, we made a recording of the show for Facebook and a podcast. Oh, no. And making a recording for the of the show for Facebook and a podcast for next week to be released is Jason Malik from Arise Studio in Conway, Arkansas. We want to thank Jason. He's been doing mm-hmm. a great job, and these podcasts are always up next week. This show, Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, began as a platform for me, a small business owner and a guest, to pay forward our experiential knowledge in a conversational way. Originally, my team and I thought it would appeal to entrepreneurs and wannabe entrepreneurs, but it seems to have had a wider audience appeal. Because after all, who isn't inspired by everyday people's American-made stories? It's no secret that successful people work hard. But a discovery I find interesting is that many, many of my guests have a spiritual bent. They believe in a higher power, thus enabling them to take risks. Now, this next discovery about entrepreneurs really caught me by surprise. Almost all my guests have the heart of the teacher, and you do too. I saw where you teach your knowledge forward. They share their knowledge and are great communicators. And last, that business in of itself is creative, more so than I ever thought. And... If you miss any part of the show or want to learn more, Chris is going to tell you how. Learn more and listen to previous interviews on UIYB by going to flagandbanner.com and clicking on Radio Show. There you'll find our guest's interview and links to resources you heard on this show. Be proactive and join our email list or like us on Facebook to get an early sneak peek of each week's guest. Thank you, Chris. My guest today saves lives, improves lives, and teaches us about the brain. It's not every day you get to speak to a brain surgeon. Many of us don't even know one. They're a rare breed, even among doctors. But today is your lucky day because after 36 years in practice, neurosurgeon Dr. Stephen Cathy has retired and graciously accepted an invitation to today's Up In Your Business show. We're going to pick his brain. I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. I, You've never I, heard that before. As I was you? telling Chris, when you called me out as a neurosurgeon, uh, first words were kind of a letdown when you meet one in person, isn't no, it? No, <laughs> it is not true. It is not true. We're going to find out from you what it's like to be you. And we're going to find out about the future of the burgeoning new science, brains research. Isn't that kind of a new science? It is. Mm-hmm. It is. And the technology is advancing so quickly. Things that 30 years ago required a scalpel and an anesthesiologist are now being done by interventional radiologists with a much lower mortality and morbidity rate. 
wow. uh, aneurysm clipping, treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, all of those things are brave new frontiers. You are an Arkansas native attending Monticello High School and the University of Arkansas at Monticello. I'm a bow weevil, yes. <laughs> Graduating, of course, with both from both with high honors. On combined scholarships, you attended the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. And in 1983, 82 and 83, you did your surgery internship at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. And after that, lucky for us, you returned back to Little Rock, Arkansas and began your long career as a neurosurgeon. In the last decade, I think this is interesting, you have been selected accumulatively three times by the Arkansas Times and AY Magazine as either the best doctor or the best physician. Pat yourself on the back. I will. Thank you, Carrie. Apart from being a surgeon, you are a teacher, an orator, and a published author. And I'm going to see if I can say these titles because I just think it's fun to mm -hmm. talk to a neurosurgeon and get to use words like this because you never get to say things like this. <laughs> Some of your articles are, you can correct me if I do it wrong, paraplegia caused by co Coartation. Coartation of the A order and hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus, yes. Hydrocephalus. That was one of your articles. The other one is the Camino Intracranial Pressure Monitor, yes. performance in experimental and clinical trials. And you most recently, just in 2017, September, I think it was, you were published an article called The Politics of Infection Disease. That one I can get my head around. That was a fun project for me because I work with some incredibly smart people at UAMS that are infectious disease specialists, and I, I had a lot of fun writing that article. Well, you're going to tell us all about it. It's a pleasure to welcome to the table my super smart nerves of steel neurologist, Dr. Stephen Cathay. Well, I, I'm not a neurologist. I'm a neurosurgeon. And you know the, oh, di you know the difference between no, a, no a neurologist and a neurosurgeon? No, I have no idea. About 300 grand a year. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's funny. <laughs> so what is a neurologist? A neurologist is one of the specialties we really lean on hard. They do a lot of the diagnostics, nerve testing, imaging studies, this, that, and the other. The neurosurgeon is the one who actually operates on the patient, who mm -hmm. uses does the, the surgery. Knife, does the surgery. That's correct. So I usually, when I think of somebody like you, I think that they came from probably a long line of family doctors. But when I read your bio, I don't think that's true. My mom and dad were school teachers. And uh, my mother was a nurse of, at the, toward the end. But yeah, I, I uh, was raised in South Arkansas, and uh, my dad, basketball coach, school teacher, my mother, the same ultimately a nurse so no no doctors in the family and I have two children neither of which have pursued a career in medicine let's just tell everybody what your son is, does this, my, is, <laughs> this is how I first met you actually very proud of my son he's a captain in the US Marine Corps uh, he's in uh, Rhode Island right now at the Naval Law Academy but he will be posted at Camp Pendleton in South Southern California, but he's a lawyer and a captain in the U.S. Marine Corps. Very, I, very proud of that kid. Absolutely. And I met you because um, you bought a flagpole for your backyard so you could put a Marine flag up. As a matter of fact, the last time I, I remember seeing you was at the grand opening of my flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, Carrie, if I had one regret about that flagpole, okay, tell me, it wasn't big enough. Oh I, my I, gosh, it's I, forty feet tall. I isn't want, it? I wanted to look like a car dealership. Well, it, it's it's a good one. Let <laughs> me tell it, you, I, I love that. I had my Marine Corps flag, my American flag, my Arkansas flag, so it was great. I, I love it. That's really. It was a blessing. How? What do you think he decided to do that? You think you're an example for him on working hard? I would like to think so. I'd like to think I was inspiration for my son. Did he just uh, always want to be a Marine? Some kids do. He went to Hendrix college and which is traditionally sort of a liberal thinking mm -hmm. liberal leaning college and he was one of the only military kids on campus but really? he he loved the marine corps he loved what it stood for stands for and he's excelled so well let's not leave your daughter out i feel like if we talk about your son we have to talk about your daughter she's very successful too yeah she's where I, she's the reason i don't have any money uh, she's at Columbia. <laughs> she's in New York right now. That's a now. good girl. That's what girls are supposed to do. All right. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, she's in graduate school at Columbia University in New York City uh, on doing broadcast journalism. That's what she'd like and to do. And she's worked on what shows? She's been on the Today Show. She's been on uh, Jimmy Fallon. 
uh, in the back in production of yes those shows. yes not, right not not in, not in front of the camera behind, but behind the, camera. the camera and she just finished two years in los angeles working for ellen degeneres and she met everybody from justin timberlake to michelle obama she it, got a good story for any of them all of them all great of them. stories so you uh went to, when did you decide you wanted to be a surgeon you went to high school like everybody and then you went to Monticello University of Arkansas Monticello what was your what was your uh, what did you think you were going to be when you went there did you know you wanted I, to be a brain I, surgeon I knew I wanted to be a doctor from and early I, on I, early on just always, like your son knew I, what always, you wanted to be. I, I knew I was fortunate because a lot of kids these days they really don't know and mm -hmm. we ask 18 year old kids to make a career decision when they don't know what they want to do but my, but I was fortunate in that way and I'll tell you the reason you're gonna laugh uh, my senior year of medical school I decided I wanted to be a neurosurgeon because the neurosurgical trainees the residents the interns the staff <laughs> and you're gonna laugh but they had the best looking girlfriends and wives of any of the other <laughs> trainees and it was like these are the coolest guys in the world they're I wanna, gonna have I, the most money those <laughs> girls are smart <laughs> absolutely I, I want to be like these guys but n n all, all kidding aside mm -hmm. I, I love the brain I love the study of neurosciences I love the neurological diseases and anyway that's where I am today so you ended up going to Baylor and Dallas I did spent a year in Dallas. Did your do they call it residency or surgery? Internship. Internship. Yeah, surgery in, internship. That's right. General surgery. Did you know appendectomies, gallbladders, hernia repairs, circumcisions. I mean just kind of the basics. And then returned to Arkansas in the summer of nineteen eighty three and began my residency training at in neurosurgery. Wanted to come back to Little Rock. Absolutely. I'm an Arkansas boy. All the way. If someone wanted to go into your profession, do you have anything to recommend to them right now? Yes. Uh, study hard. Uh, try to make good grades because it's a very competitive program to be a neurosurgery resident. Dr. John Day is chairman of neurosurgery at UAMS. Does a fantastic job. But, you know, they pick the best the brightest and the guys and girls with the you know the you know the best grades best academics and the most successful and, and that's just the nature of the business did you ever make an attempt and fail at something and then have to come back and like take another course again or were you just sailing through everything i sailed i was lucky i had great uh i had great teachers great professors and i i really never suffered any setbacks in my training that's pretty unusual that's a great brain well it's a were, big old brain you even give your brain to science i Probably. I think I could give my brain to science. I, I'm not sure what it would be. It probably weighs about two pounds. I could throw it. <laughs> All right. This is a great place That's to a take. That's a perfect question. I've never had that before. <laughs> when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with retired neurosurgeon Dr. Stephen Cathy. We'll pick his brain again. Sorry. Oh, my God. About, no pun intended. I know. I can't help myself. <laughs> about life as a specialized surgeon, about the burgeoning science of brain research and the secrets it may unlock and last what he's doing today after retirement we'll be back we'll be back after the break want to create excitement for your business or event do it with affordable advertising from arkansas's flag and banner.com we have teardrop banners retractable banners and table drapes we have street pole banners museum and exhibit banners we have custom flags event tents tailgating poles auto graphics and window scrim and don't forget welcome home and sale banners consult the experts at arkansas's flag and banner.com Go online for a free quote or drop by our historic showroom at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I had something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. 
Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Boost morale and patriotism with a new flag or flagpole from Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. We have poles, hardware, accessories, maintenance support, installation, and custom flags. We have flags of all kinds for the sports enthusiast, the world traveler, or history buff. We have them all. Bring in your old flag and get $5 off a new one. Consult the experts at ArkansasFlagandBanner.com. Come shop our historic location at 800 West Knight Street in Little Rock or visit us online at FlagandBanner.com. And now, back to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. We are listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy. I'm cutting it up with Steve Cathy, Dr. Steve Cathy. We're old friends. We go way back. I hope you didn't hear what we were saying on the break. That's why you should be watching Facebook Live because it's all right there for you to see at FlagandBanner.com's Facebook page. But I'm speaking with retired neurosurgeon and author, Dr. Stephen Cathy. Before the break, we talked about how smart you are. (laughs) <laughs> no, we Thank talked you. about uh, being a neurosurgeon, your life in Monticello, you know, how competitive it is to become one and how you just really need to work hard. Uh, but being a brain surgeon is not for the faint of heart. Uh, my friend Kathy, when I, she asked me this week, she said, who are you having on? I said, oh, I'm having on Dr. Kathy. He's a brain surgeon. She said, you know, when I'm having a bad day, I look at my friends and say, well, at least I'm not having to do brain surgery. <laughs> I was like, yeah, who wants to ever do that? So uh, I really wanted to be a rocket scientist, but I ended really? up going to brain surgery. No. no. <laughs> <I'm kidding>. So <laughs> seriously, what is it like to play God? Oh, Carrie, you know, it, it it's a very awesome and humbling experience to take care of someone and to know that during some of these surgeries, some of these procedures take 10, 12 hours and you're operating through a tiny opening in someone's brain and it's tedious punctuated by sheer panic when a, something starts to bleed or you get into part of the brain you really didn't mean to get into you know you make a technical error or things like that and and as we talked earlier one of the advances in neuroscience has been this um, less invasive procedures where you no longer have to open the skull. You can actually do it through a catheter into the brain to clip an aneurysm or to treat a brain tumor. And it's been extremely, uh, it's profoundly limited the, the risk of surgery and bleeding and death and morbidity. So, yeah, it gets better every day. The technology is getting you better every day. You started 36 years ago. I did. So that would be like 1992. Oh. No, 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 82. That would be yeah, 82. Yeah, that's right. Boy, there have been huge advances in 30 years. Absolutely. I mean, it used to be... Uh, for example, one, one condition is called trigeminal neuralgia, which is a painful condition of the face caused by the fifth cranial nerve, trigeminal nerve. And in, in the old days, we would go in and literally explore the nerve, uh, lesion the nerve to prevent pain. Now we have what's called radio surgery, or the gamma knife, which we radiate the nerve. Is and it, What do you the, mean you radiate the nerve? You, you send a high pulse of gamma radiation directed in a very small area around the nerve. And it kills the nerve? It kills the nerve. Well, it kills the painful aspects of the nerve. And um, it's, it's been revolutionary. Can but, we just do that everywhere? Can we do it on your on like your feet? People have nerve damage in their feet. Can you do that everywhere? No, not everywhere. But the technology is advancing. So I think someday you will be able to not even have to use a scalpel. What would you call that? Tri- Trigeminal neuralgia. You know, that's pretty common. It is. It's a very painful condition of the face. My daughter has that. Is that right? Okay. She does. She got it from a dental procedure. That's right. Absolutely. That's one of the complications of root canals or dental surgery. She just had a tooth pulled. And then she kept complaining about it. And I thought, you're just crazy. She had injury to her trigeminal nerve in in, in all likelihood. And it's treatable, but it's horribly painful. Yes. Um, How do you... How do you stop and smell the roses when you're smart as you are and driven as you are? How do you get pleasure out of life of just saying, okay, now I'm not doing it right now. I just want to stop and kind of not think for a minute. I miss it every day. You do. I miss it every day. And, you know, I just you get to a point in your career 
which I think most physicians do, you get to a point where you realize you've been doing this too long and there are smarter guys, younger guys, more energetic guys that do it better. So it's time to take a step back. And that's what I did. Just, in fact, just uh, April of this year. Yeah, that's right. I was actually chairman of the state medical board up until April of this year. And then after I retired, I stepped down as chairman. Uh, but that was a fabulous experience being on the state medical board. I was originally appointed by, by Governor BB and then reappointed by Governor Hutchinson, two of the finest men I've ever known in my life. And uh, I was lucky and blessed enough to serve the people of Arkansas in that capacity. And that, that probably was the high point of my professional career. What are you going to do now? Well, I'd say play golf. Yes. <laughs> Chris, Chris agrees. Yeah, with that. Absolutely. <laughs> play golf. Uh, <laughs> hang out with my kids. Yeah. They're not going to hang out with you. No, they won't. They don't now. <laughs> All right. Well, tell us what it's like when you were a practicing when you were a practicing surgeon. What's your day like? How many did you do a week? What did you do the day? How many did you do? Did you? I mean, a ten or twelve hour surgery. You could only mm -hmm. do one a week, maybe. That's right. No, I, I never. I always did. It at least two or three cases a week. How did you manage? What did you get up? You start at five in the morning. Yep. You, you wake up, yep. you get your coffee, you take a shot of liquor. So I didn't. Do, I, just calm your nerves. That's you know what, what I have to do. Honestly, taking a shot of liquor is better than a shot of coffee because you don't want your hand to have a tremor. Oh. You, you, you really have to have very steady hands and caffeine promotes tremors. So I didn't drink coffee on days I operated, but and I honestly didn't drink. Well, <laughs> after, after surgery, that was a whole, whole, other whole story. other story. So you get up, you start. What time do you start in the middle in the day? Well, at the peak of my career, you're right. I would I would be up at five thirty, and you would go and make rounds on the patients that you had operated on the day before because you had to be in the operating room at seven o'clock. So you had to be there by five thirty, six o'clock. So you could just check on everyone you'd done surgery on the day before. And then you might get home at 10 o'clock at night. And then you've also got to figure in to see new clients. That's right. Yeah, I had I had clinic days, which is, are days where you, uh, you see patients in your office and uh, you try to diagnose them and not everyone needs surgery. You know, a lot of folks, you need to prescribe physical therapy, medication, do testing, and that's what I would do on my days when I was not operating. And those were fun days too. You like the, all of it? Oh yeah, absolutely. I would think if I was a surgeon, I would only like surgery. Well, surgery was absolutely the most rewarding part of it. Plus, you got paid better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, did you like nurses that you worked with all yes. the time? The same group, were they your nurses or the hospital's nurses? They were the hospital nurses, but they were assigned to me. Uh, for the last 10 years, I worked at Arkansas Surgical Hospital, and I had I had tremendous nurses. They were awesome. I had tremendous nurse anesthetists, anesthesia, and and uh, circulating nurses, and all that. I I, I, I it, it's all part of a team. You're you're not the only guy out there doing this. You you got to lean heavily on your nurses and your anesthesia and your radiology techs and those kinds of so when you So when you're doing a 12-hour surgery, you can't not... Don't you have to stop to eat? I've always wondered about that. I always had to stop to go to the bathroom. And to go to, and to eat. Uh, no, eating was not a big factor. You can look at me and tell that wasn't a big deal. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> oh, well, just, you know, I, 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 food never really factored into it. But, you know, you do have to take a break occasionally because you start to go cross-eyed. staring I into. Think. A, I would not a, want a 12-hour surgery. Well, and, I would think you would only peak for a few hours in the day and the rest of the time like you said you're poking I have, the wrong part. I have never understood surgeons who will start an elective case at seven o'clock at night. I don't really think that's fair to the patient. I don't, you're I can't tired believe. you've been working for twelve hours and now you're gonna start doing a case at seven PM. I mean it's I, to, I never thought that was a good practice. And I, I never did that. I don't even want to be after lunch. <laughs> I wanna be You wanna first, be that first person in the morning. Absolutely you're right, when Carrie. they're fresh. Unless they drink a lot, then I wanna be maybe the second one. <laughs> and I always ask the guy if I have to go in for anything, I say, please don't drink the night before. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, whatever. You would not believe how often that question comes up. Oh, 
bitch. I always say, no, you're not going to get drunk the night before. And they go, no, just a little bit. They always tease me a little bit. So I know this is such a stressful job. And I know you've had to lose some patients or been disappointed in your surgeries. Absolutely. How do you deal with that? I had a case that you, when you mentioned that, one comes to mind. This patient had a vertebral artery aneurysm, which is a very rare aneurysm at the very base of the brain. And an aneurysm is like a balloon on an artery in the brain, and they bleed. And I had spent about 12 hours getting this aneurysm exposed and dissected and putting the clip on it. And after 12 hours, everything going perfectly, it ruptured and the patient died on the operating table. And it's just so, I mean, it really is the most frustrating, heartbreaking. You have to go out and tell the family, you know, patient didn't make it and everything was perfect and I will say this and I, in over 30 years of practice I never had a malpractice case against me that's good yeah I mean I never I never I well I was never negligent I'd like to think in treating my my flock my patients your flock yeah they are Do my you just flock. have to turn it over to to the universe and say you know it was his time i did everything i could do yeah you have to let go don't you you do you do and it it haunts you i mean you think about it all the time what if i'd, I'd done do. that what ifs the what ifs absolutely what if i'd have done this what if i'd done that so how do you deal with that well you just move on to the next patient you know if you don't have any well, i thought about this this morning if you don't have any what ifs then I don't think you're living your life full, and full I think, enough. I think that's true of every profession. Mm -hmm. You know, firemen, policemen, I mean, we all have things that we look back on and say, had I done this differently, would there have been a better outcome? Mm -hmm. um, you want to take another break? I think that's a great place. We can. All right. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with retired neurosurgeon surgeon, Dr. Stephen Cathy. You don't have to say retired so loud. <laughs> okay. We'll, re we'll, we'll, retired. we'll continue our conversation with retired neurosurgeon, Dr. Stephen Cathy. I have a feeling you're going to be unretired within a year. I do know friends that do that. Good possibility. Yeah. In the next segment, we'll talk about the burgeoning science of brain research and get Dr. Cathy's take on it. And last, less than a year ago, Kathy you wrote an article for Arkansas Medical Science publication. I guess that's what AMS stands for. Uh, Arkansas Medical Society. Society. I tried to guess. Arkansas Medical Society publication called The Politics of Infection Disease. I'm very curious. If you read that, you would probably be one of the only ones. So. Of course I did not read it. I do not read anyway anything. So no, I didn't read it. That's why you're here. You're going to tell us what it said. But first I want to remind everyone we're broadcasting live every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. Central Time on both KABF 88.3 FM, The Voice of the People, and FlagandBanner.com's Facebook page. And that after one week of every show's airing, a podcast is made available on all popular listening sites and YouTube. We'll talk more after the break. Want to create excitement for your business or event? Do it with affordable advertising from Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. We have teardrop banners, retractable banners, and table drapes. We have street pole banners, museum and exhibit banners. We have custom flags, event tents, tailgating poles, auto graphics, and window scrim. And don't forget, welcome home and sale banners. Consult the experts at Arkansas's FlagandBanner.com. Go online for a free quote or drop by our historic showroom at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Boost morale and patriotism with a new flag or flagpole from Arkansas's flagandbanner.com. We have polls, 
hardware, accessories, maintenance support, installation, and custom flags. We have flags of all kinds for the sports enthusiast, the world traveler, or history buff. We have them all. Bring in your old flag and get $5 off a new one. Consult the experts at ArkansasFlagandBanner.com. Come shop our historic location at 800 West 9th Street in Little Rock or visit us online at FlagandBanner.com. And now welcome back to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy. Thank you, Chris. People do pledge to KABF. It's just a great community service. It's a wonderful group of people here, and they just do they do something that nobody else does. And they're 100 watt. It goes all over. It's, I think it's got the largest wattage of any radio station in Arkansas. 100,000 watts. I'm sorry, watts. keep me straight. 100,000 uh, okay. watts. Chris, I don't know if you know this, but oh, in my college days, I was the voice of Southeast Arkansas. On, oh, you were on the radio? Uh, KH, KHBM, Monticello. Okay. I did uh, I did sports, play-by-play -play for the Monticello High School and for the University of Arkansas Monticello. So you love radio. Oh, I love radio. You're an audio I, file. I, I used to make promos and I'd go to the station and you know had had interviews it, right. was, it was really fun these public uh, radio okay. stations are really important for educating uh, and letting young people get chances to try to be you know on the radio find out if you like it my daughter uh, when she went to undergraduate school she was at New York University and when, while she was at NYU she did every day at like two o'clock she was on the air for WNYU and then ah. she did the news and weather and all that is stuff. Is that how come so, she decided to be a broadcaster? I think so. I think that's where she got her appetite for, you know, broadcast journalism. Well, let me tell everybody that I'm speaking today to retired neurosurgeon <laughs> and author, Dr. Stephen Cathy. If you have a question, make a comment on flagandbanner.com's page or write this number down and call. 501-433-0088. That's 501-433-0088. But Chris has a great radio voice. Well, he's a, well, thank he's you. a professional <laughs> DJ, isn't this he? This is my third week here. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It is your third week here. And if you're shy, you can just creep on my weekly blog about life as a small business owner at flagandbanner.com. Or as I said earlier, you can listen to our podcast. They're all made available next week at Flag and Banner. Before the break, we talked about becoming a neurosurgeon. That was the first break. And then the second break, we talked about the stress and the life of being a neurosurgeon and how you prepare for it and, um, you know, what a day and is like, you know, seeing and, patients. And, and let me just add this real quick. Mm -hmm. we, we talked about my, my profession and my, my specialty, but there are so many really great doctors out there, primary care, family practice, who that phone rings at 2.30 in the morning and they're up and they're going to the hospital and they're going to the ER. And it's not just neurosurgeons that are committed. There are really, really fine physicians in the state. There are so many physicians and nurses when you go to the hospitals, I am shocked at what a huge business that is. It is. It, it is a, and, and good and bad. It has in some ways become a big money business, which is kind of a, you know, a little bit not the way I think it should be that we focus on money as much as we focus on patient care. But that's just the nature of the business mm -hmm. of the beast everything's about money yep, not just is. them everything it, is you gotta pay true. for it yeah, even churches have to make money whenever i go to the church uh um uh, meetings and talk about money and they always there. pass the plate they pass the plate <laughs> and i always try to make them you know do more things that have to do with money and they go we're a church we're not it's not a business i'm like yeah it is we gotta make some money or the doors aren't or open the doors won't be open i know right. so let's talk about uh past brain research Correct me if I'm wrong, but prior to Obama, were we unable to do very much brain research? Were there limitations? No, there. Again, it's a little bit out of my area of expertise, but um, there has been progressive advances in neuroscience uh, since I've been in practice. And I think the most exciting things and the challenges are going to be in the areas of like Alzheimer's research and dementia mm -hmm. and you know, Parkinson's disease. And none of the uh, 
uh, it's not the sexy stuff like brain surgery, but it's vitally important and the research is important. And I, I believe maybe over the next 30, 40 years, you're going to see cures for Alzheimer's and you're going to see cures for Parkinson's disease. Do you believe vitamin E is really helpful for Alzheimer's? I I don't really have an opinion on it. So no. So no. I I would say no. I have a girlfriend (laughs) whose husband has it. She's just feeding him vitamin E like crazy. Well, I don't think it's going to hurt him. Um, Um, They didn't. I don't think. I thought I saw a special where prior to Obama, you weren't allowed to take the criminally insane's brains and cut them open. Is that true? Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with uh, think, President Obama. No, but I think it was politics for some reason. And there, When I first went into my training back in the early 80s, there was an area kind of quietly discussed about lobotomy, where you would send a patient to a neurosurgeon who did what's called functional neurosurgery, and they would, you know, resect a part of the brain to... Uh, ostensibly to treat seizures but in in all honesty what they were trying to do was prevent the patient from you know being a sex offender or you know being a you know quote unquote criminally insane but it kind of lost a lot of its validity as time went on and it, there were medications that were better uh, suited to treat if you if you want to say treat uh, to to deal with these individuals I'm talking about dead people oh uh um, no about people who's criminally insane cutting their taking their brain and giving it to science and cutting it open to see if there was something about their brain different from other people's brain i i don't know about that particular type of research um i know that you would have to have a lot of permission well you'd have to have permission from families and what have you to do that and I'm not really sure how much benefit would be gained by looking at the the anatomical sections of a brain of a quote unquote criminally insane individual but I I know that research has been done and it had nothing to do with politics it it was done it just happened to be in that era maybe that it was allowed so um, that brings me to Einstein's brain oh my gosh that's a brain now. That's a brain. But you know, it's not any bigger than anybody else's. And this is one of the things I love about this show, is that I hate the fact that I'm under this deadline to read all this stuff, but I love the fact that it forces me to read all this stuff, and I have just been in just reading and watching. There's so much about Einstein's brain, about... And he de- I, 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 and again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking outside the box on this, but I think Einstein was a professor at Princeton University in New Jersey, and he did donate his brain to science. <laughs> and what, what I know about brain size doesn't necessarily correlate to brain function. I know that Lord Byron, the poet, supposedly had the largest brain of any known human being. It was like... Average brain is 2.5 pounds, and his was like 10. Whoa. <laughs> That's a heavy head to carry around. <laughs> Again, I, I'm just speaking way off the cuff there, so I don't know. But Lord Byron apparently the did, biggest brain. had, a, had, the, had biggest the biggest brain, brain ever recorded, yeah. So does the size of your head actually have to do with the size of your brain? Do you know? It does. Mm-hmm. And there have been studies uh, done on uh, with regard to Alzheimer's disease that people with big heads are less likely to, you know... Um, uh, contract Alzheimer's. So I'm looking at Chris over there saying he's big head. He's, he's, in the, he's safe. <laughs> you Thank are you. too, Kathy. I think I'm I'd in like trouble. To. I'm in trouble. I look pinched over here compared to y'all. Thank God I'm not a urologist on this show. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Let's get one of those. All right. So this is what I wrote about right. Einstein's brain. Thomas Harvey in 1955 did the autopsy. Mm-hmm. He, in, it, was it at Princeton? At Princeton? I don't remember. Remember, but I think you might be right. Seven hours after Einstein's death. Uh oh, whose phone's ringing? Mm, it's not mine. It's yours. It's mine. Uh oh. There we go. I got mine on Uh-oh. solid. Uh oh. I'm okay. the f- fire me. Uh, <laughs> all right. Seven hours after his death, he uh, took his brain out, and he—I don't know if this happened seven hours, but over the next period of time, he dissected it into 
240 sections. Oh, wow. And he gave it to all of these scientists to see if they could find anything different about it. Chris, you're nodding like you knew this. No, no, no. I, it's interesting. I, I would be surprised if they found anything different about it. I can't believe you don't know this, that you're not curious to find out about this. <laughs> so, so this is what's really weird. Is in So he died in 55. Okay. In 1978, a journalist, Stephen Levy, uh, rediscovered that it was in Harvey's possession and found it in the trunk of his car in a cedar box in mason jars that he'd been carrying around in the trunk of his car for 20 years. Now that I did know. Hmm. I did I did hear that the pathologist had kept Einstein's brain. In the trunk of his car, in a mason jar. <laughs> so in 2010, the Harvey family gave it to uh, the National Museum of Health and Medicine. And if you go there... Oh, and he took 14 photographs of it before he dissected it, which is good. And so they found out that he has, let's see, he has something unusual about it. His this. corpus callosum was big. What is that? It's the, Are you uh, talking dirty to me? No, 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 no. Oh, it's okay. the part of the, it's the, it's the <laughs> structure that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. And I, I just threw that out okay, there. Okay, this is know. what it is. The missing part, he was miss his Sylvian Fisher. Sylvian Fisher, yeah. Was missing, which, which made another part of his brain enlarged that was, that was, uh, oh, I didn't write down what that part was, that would make him have uh, not very good verbal skills because he didn't learn to speak till he was very young, young, very old. But he had great imaginary, and so he could he could he could envision what um, he could envision. You know, relativity. Right, that he discovered. right. He could think in three D, or he could think about relativity and those yes. theories. I, I know that Einstein was a basically a patent clerk in Vienna yeah. and worked out uh, the theory that stars that went extinct billions of years ago are still shining. And I, I think that's an incredible leap for science that you could figure out that that star you're looking at has not been uh, emitting any any sunlight or starlight for billions of years, and Einstein worked all that out. And you have to imagine, guy was smart. And the other thing about Einstein, he was apparently a very funny guy. Had yeah. a good sense of humor, and his students loved him. And and I think that's important too. You can be a brilliant man, but you also need to be. A funny man. <laughs> oh, I think humor is so important, especially if you're teaching. It's how you keep kind of engaged with your audience, I think. I told you, that's why I went into neurosurgery. Those were the funniest guys and had the best-looking girlfriends. So so if you want to see a part of uh, Einstein's brain, it's on display in Philadelphia at the Mütter M Museum, and they have sliced it up. Really? And it's under, yeah, you might like this, and it's under a microscope. And you can go up there and look through a microscope at it. Do you know, while you're talking about anatomical specimens, you can go to the National Military Museum in Washington and John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated yeah. President Lincoln, they did an autopsy on him and that he was shot through the neck when the Union troops caught up with him down in uh, Virginia. He was shot through the neck and was paralyzed when he died. They, they dissected his spinal cord uh, where the bullet went through, and you can go to this museum in Washington, and you can look at John Wilkes Booth's spinal cord. I, that's one of the. That's on my bucket list. I want to do that one time before I die. Oh wow! So what's Since new? we're speaking neurosurgery, there. Yeah, I love all this stuff. Really, yeah, really it's interesting. It's pretty interesting Absolutely. stuff. Um, so and another thing about Einstein's brain, and then we'll quit talking about it. No, is I love Einstein. It had. Let me see. Okay, these are called Einstein's brain had more glial cells. Glial. Glial cells relative to neurons. What does well, that mean? Okay, there are two types of brain cells. Uh, glial is like the supporting cells. It's like if you eat a steak. The part of the steak that the gristle, for example, that's analogous to a glial cell. It's a supporting fibrous tissue. Mm -hmm. The neuron is the it's the nerve cell. It's what mm -hmm. you know allows you to smile, laugh, move your right arm, blink Send your signals. eyes. Send Send the signals. It, it's the it's the signal sender. Mm -hmm. And the glial cells is the are the cells that support the neurons. Mm -hmm. And most malignant brain tumors uh, arise from the glial cells. That's why they're called glioblastoma or a glioblastoma multiforme because they begin in the supporting cells of the brain and they're highly malignant. 
So he's lucky he didn't have. Yeah, if you got a brain tumor, he. So why would that make any difference to Einstein's intelligence? It doesn't. It seems I, like it'd be a handicap. I don't know enough about any this information and this well, research it's all to conje- know. It's all conjecture. They can't right. prove anything. They have no idea. I mean, there's there's nothing. It's just all right. I mean, and I'm sure guesses. it probably is. In 1957, when 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 he died, 55. 55. I, I doubt that there was that much advancement in neuropathology to kind of know mm-hmm. and. You, as you very aptly said, it's conjecture. It's all, yeah. But but it is it is kind of interesting and fun to talk about. So let's talk about brain research. We've already talked about the fact that uh, we don't have to. It's 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 not as invasive as it used to be. That's correct. Is there anything else that's coming down the pike that you think is going to be really interesting about? It's going to affect Americans. I think the next great advance in neuroscience will be gene research, where you can actually use stem cells to perhaps uh, a patient that's got uh, who has a spinal cord injury for example that would be a good one and they could inject stem cells to regenerate a spinal cord and i think that's coming i don't think it's very close. I think it's going to be probably after our lifetimes. But it doesn't seem like it should be. Stem cells are well, already. Yeah, I know, but it is. Um, it, it it really is going to be a ways off. But I, I think that that's going to be a very brave new world when it comes to neuroscience research. Is is stem cells to treat strokes, to treat spinal cord injuries, to to treat you know brain tumors and those types of things let me just take a break congenital abnormalities so yeah congenital abnormalities uh, i'm just going to take a quick break and tell everybody you're listening to up in your business with me carrie mccoy and i'm speaking today with retired neurosurgeon and author dr stephen kathy all right you've got to know the answer to this one you're the one person that can know the answer to this nature versus nurture <laughs> you know the brain is it the chicken or the egg is yep. that what we're... <laughs> you've got to know the answer to that you've got enough brains is it nature versus nurture is it nurture versus nature what do you think what's are your we, opinion are we taking a break or are we going to answer no, that, this already, that was the break i just told her that was a station break you know my opinion as a, a neurosurgeon clinic a clinical neurosurgeon and not a research neurosurgeon my personal opinion is I think it's I think it's nurture I really you do you really do I do you think so when you look at all the brains you think they're all the same no not necessarily I mean they there are congenital abnormalities but I think if I took a child out of one environment into another one and changed the circumstances I believe it's more nurture but that is just an opinion more of a conjecture. humble neuro- more conjecture. <laughs> yeah, it's more conjecture. I thought maybe you were going to say, you know, no, you cut a brain open, they look so much different. They all look so much different, but they really they re- don't. They do really they? don't. They all they look really the don't. same. Except I know Einstein didn't have a Sylvian Fisher. There you go. <laughs> and uh, who was that Baron that had a ten pound brain? Oh, Lord Byron. Byron. Yeah, the poet. Uh, all right. Well, you Slept wrote- with uh, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yeah. 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 See? You learn something on this show. I I'm always a, learn I'm something. I'm a renaissance man. <laughs> you really are. Uh, all right. Let's talk about the paper you wrote. The oh. last one in 73, 19, I mean, 2017, 2017, you wrote a paper called Politics of Infection Disease. I did not read it. What's it about? But it sounds interesting. When I was chairman of the medical board, we had two of absolutely the most knowledgeable um informed infectious disease specialists in the country, not just in Little Rock. Dr. Joseph Beck, who was the chairman before I was on the medical board, and Dr. Tom Brasher over at UAMS. And they had put out some guidelines about how we treat HIV positive or how we deal with HIV positive physicians, specifically medical students, house staff, at the school, how do we do you do you reveal their positive for HIV or, or do we reveal their positive for hepatitis C and this type of thing? And the politics came in because their recommendations were the treatment's so good, it really doesn't it shouldn't matter. We don't really need to be telling patients that Dr. X or Dr. Y or Z has HIV or has Hep C. However, 
the politics overrode it. Transparency. They wanted. They said you got to you got to tell people this. And and my point was, politics still influences how we deal with infections, just like during the polio epidemic when you know, municipalities would close swimming pools yeah. because there would be an outbreak of polio. And it, it dealt with President Roosevelt being elected president four times from a wheelchair, and that would never happen today. No. And it it was, I, I enjoyed researching that article, and I thought it was pretty good. So what, so what are you trying to say? What I was saying is that? that, you know, there's not any politics related to taking out an appendix. But there's a lot of politics related to infections, particularly tuberculosis, um, because, HIV. They, because you can catch it. That's right. Absolutely, and and it, rightfully so. And it's a public. It's a public. Uh, it's service. public concern. Oh, it's you a public know. concern. And you know, uh, for example, when I was a senior in medical school, I had worked a lot at the VA, the old VA. <laughs> As you say, retired. I'm old, too. I worked down at the VA on Roosevelt, and I contracted TB. Uh, my, my skin test became positive. Uh, it's called the PPD test, where they inject you with the, the, the virus, the bacteria, and you have a reaction. And they said, from now on, you never need to have another TB test because you could really hurt yourself. It could be damaging to your skin. So now when the hospital would say, we, you need to come in and do your, your TB test, I'd say, well, I'm positive. And they'd go, oh, well, then you don't have to have a test. And I, always, it, it, it just, I was amazed that now that I'm positive, nobody cares that I have it. But if I wasn't positive, they want to test me. They didn't do anything with that information. That's and what that, I was going to say. What they do with that information? No, nothing. They'd say, "Oh, you're positive. Uh, don't worry about Nobody it." Nobody has tuberculosis anymore. Are you cured, or does it ever cure? Uh, Is it just dormant? It's dormant. I'm. I'm. I, my skin test would still be positive, but I've never manifested any of the, you know, productive cough or weight loss or chest abnormalities i just happened to got i got enough of exposure to the to the bacteria that, that, that i tested positive and that that kind of made me wonder why do we have this test when you don't do anything with the information just tell tell do you the take precautions no for, for for with your patients you don't need to because you're not contagious that's right that's yeah, what that's i've been a told silly, that's a silly it's thing a to... silly test in my opinion and that and that's what kind of piqued my interest in writing an article about the politics of infectious disease yeah because there's no politics related to a hysterectomy but there's a lot of politics but related. again it's not contagious but tuberculosis is not contagious so i'm not it sure. is it is, it well, is but, contagious. but you said you're not contagious well they I, i've been told by my friends they're pulmonologists that i don't have to worry that's about such it. an old-fashioned it is it's an antiqu it's an antiquated test and I, you know, that that's why I wanted to write this article and just get people thinking you, about you it. You brought a bit. up so many things that have to do with my family. My grandfather died from tuberculosis. Oh, he did. My did daughter he? has trigomyalgia. Yeah. And my grandfather died from tuberculosis. What else can we talk about? Uh, we can talk about <laughs> anything. I've, did, did he go to the sanatorium up in Boonville? Because he was on his way to Arizona when he died. Oh, or okay. New Mexico, somewhere out there. That gotcha. was so long ago. It was probably the gotcha. 30s. The treatment probably is much different now. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I didn't even know anybody even still had tuberculosis. Do you know the, the same bacteria that causes TB is related to the bacteria that causes leprosy? They're very related. It's hard to tell the difference between the bacterium producing uh, tuberculosis and leprosy. Interesting. So uh, if 20 years ago, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself? I would have probably taken some prophylactic treatment for it. Um, you know, they they recommended that I take this drug uh, called rifampin for about nine months, but I didn't want to take it because they said you couldn't drink and take it, so I took my chances, and I'm here today. You're doing just fine. <laughs> yeah, anything, Good call. Yeah. <laughs> Good call. Uh, what do you want your legacy to be? My children. I, I want I want my children to be proud of me, and I want them to succeed. And so far, uh, they've 
been exceptional kids and that's my legacy mm-hmm. is I've tried to raise two really tremendous kids and I hope that my patients will look back and say Dr. Kathy was took care of me and took care of my family that that's my legacy because brain surgery often makes people walk again doesn't it it does yeah absolutely what, what, is, the, what is the most common brain surgery uh, surgery that you do probably. trauma from a head injury mm-hmm. from a head injury from a gunshot wound or a depressed skull fracture or you know someone hitting you in the head i'll tell you a quick story i, mm-hmm. I know you we're on the clock here but i was leaving a razorback football game one night over at uh, little rock at war memorial and I get a call from the emergency room, and they call me, and they say, we've got a girl here who um, has been hit in the head with a beer bottle, and she's got mm. a fractured skull. So I went straight to the ER. First thing I do is get an x-ray, and she's awake, alert, talking. We get an x-ray, and she's got a bullet in her brain. <laughs> oh, my god! And I said, I said, I got some good news and some bad news. Good news is you didn't get hit in the head with a beer bottle. Bad news is you got shot in the head. But she did fine. We just took her surgery. And, it can change your personality. But she just assumed, you know, something hit me in the head. It was a stray gunshot wound. Wow. It can change your personality a lot, though, can't it? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. For permanently. Absolutely. Yeah. Depending on what part of the brain's injured, you know. Because some sides are angry? Uh, well, some parts of the brain are more elegant. You know, you talk about the Sylvian Fisher. That's very elegant brain tissue. It's where your motor speech center is located. Whereas you can, you know, have a injury to the frontal lobe of the brain, particularly the right frontal lobe, because most people are right-handed. So that makes the oh, that's that right. makes the left side of the brain dominant. Mm-hmm. Oh, but but okay. you, yeah, you depending on where the tumor is or the injury is. De- determines the significance and the impact of the injury or the insult to the neurological tissue. Yeah. Do uh, different races have thicker skulls? You know, I don't know, Carrie. Um, I do believe African Americans have thicker skulls, and I think that's just part of the evolution mm-hmm. of the African continent and what, it, that type of thing. But I don't quote me on that. I have a friend who's Native American, and she said she was in a car wreck, and that her boyfriend died from a head injury, and she didn't. And he said that it, it had to do with skull thickness. Mm-hmm. She, she said she's a Native American, and she said, and he told me that. I had a really thick skull. Uh, I I wouldn't speculate on that, I honestly. I thought that was interesting, though. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, uh, to quote you, conjecture. That's more conjecture. Uh, all right. Uh, I think it's uh, time for me to give you your gift. Oh, my gosh. I hope it's a car. <laughs> I do too. Oh, That'd be nice. Oh, it's thank a desk you. set with a U.S. Oh, Arkansas and a, and a Marine. Marine. Thank yes. you so much. You're and, and thank you, Chris. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, it was this a great is very show. thoughtful. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you for coming on, Steve. I really Anytime. Time. Call you. me again. All right, yeah. I will. I won't be retired next time. I think that may be true. <laughs> Who's our guest next week? That would be Creighton Rawls. And if you don't know who that is, he's the owner and manager of the Prospect Building, which is a high rise and high-end apartment building in downtown Little Rock. Yep. He's doing it. He's going to come on and talk about apartments in downtown Little Rock. Well, I'll tell you what. He's got a tough act to follow. Why? <laughs> just... Oh, because of you? Oh, I get it. It took me a while. I was like, what? What do you mean? What? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. He's got to make in front of me. Uh, yeah, he does. You're exactly right. Thank but, you But, so you know, much. I know his mother, Barbara, and she has traveled around for years and years and years collecting art. She's just an amateur art collector. And so this building that her family owns and her son runs, the Prospect Building, on the ground, floor has a gallery and so she sells you know when you're a collector you got to have some place to get rid of some of that so you can keep collecting so they also sell art on the first floor of the prospect building i've enjoyed hosting with you today chris absolutely as well i've enjoyed talking to you so much deep guy thank you carrie I thank you chris you. thank you I, I really enjoyed being here telling what i know <laughs> you tell it good too uh, if you have a great entrepreneurial story that you would like to share i would love to hear from you send a brief bio and your contact contact info to question at upyourbusiness.org and finally to our listeners thank you for spending time with me if you think this program has been about you you're right but it's also been for me thank you for letting me fulfill my destiny my hope today is that you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it whatever it is will help you up your business your independence or your life i'm carrie mccoy and i'll see you next time on up in your business until then be brave and keep it up 
You've been listening to Up In Your Business with Carrie McCoy, a production of FlagAndBanner.com. All interviews are recorded and posted online with links to resources you heard discussed on today's show. So subscribe to her weekly podcast whenever you'd like to listen. Carrie's goal is simple, to help you live the American dream.